This is the Your Kick Ass Life Podcast, episode number 77, with guest Megan Hale. All links and resources from this podcast can be found by going to yourkickasslife.com forward slash 77. This is the Your Kick Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self help and badassery. Because, ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host. The girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. As always, I'm very excited about today's guest. I was a guest on Megan Hale's podcast and we had such an amazing conversation. I was like, I can't, I can't stop talking to you. So (laughs) I brought her on my podcast to talk about something that is so very, very, very important. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. Let me tell you a little bit about Megan. Megan Hale is a retired psychotherapist, enoughness coach, and women's leadership mentor. She works with her clients to break free from the self-defeating beliefs of never enough to live true, live brave, and live whole. She's an advocate for courageous, authentic living and believes the future belongs to women who are free and empowered to make their own rules and know the value of inner work that translates to outer results. And before we get started, I just wanted to let y'all know, well, I mean, you already know that the holidays are upon us and uh, my book is still on sale, yourkickasslife.com forward slash 52 ways, the numbers five, two. And for a personally assigned copy, you need to get it from that page. My book is available on Amazon and pretty much anywhere books are sold in bookstores. And if you want a personally assigned copy, you can get one on sale, 15 bucks. That includes shipping to us only. If you want this for Christmas, which is in like nine days, you would probably have to order it within the next couple of days um, to make sure that it gets there in time or, you know, New Year's gift and beyond. (laughs) It's all good. So just an extra heads up for that. Yourkickasslife.com forward slash 52 ways. And without further ado, here is Megan. Hello there, ass kickers. Welcome to episode 77. I am excited, as always, to bring you my guest today. Megan Hale interviewed me a couple of weeks ago, and I could have talked to her all day long, and I was just like, you have to come on my podcast, like today. So I'm so glad to have you. Hey! Yay! I'm excited to be here. Awesome. And as all of my people know, these are very casual conversations, and today is is no exception. We're going to talk about something that can not be casual, but is so important, and that is the whole concept of worthiness. And let's just jump right in, because I love that you call yourself an enoughness coach. Mm-hmm. And so can you describe for us... Who are the women that you help and like who would need an enoughness coach? You know, I was reading over this question before we got started. I'm like, how do I narrow that down? Because I feel like so many of us, like women and men alike, we have these feelings of not enough. It's such a human quality. So I feel like anyone who feels like they're not enough can really benefit from the work. But the women that I mostly find are women who are super high achievers. They're out there. They're doing some big things. And it's a go, go, go mentality. But it never seems to be fulfilling. Right. And there's always more to do and more to get. And they're on this more train where they're never really finding the payoff of the joy and fulfillment that they're really after. The more train. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> like I look at it as, as kind of like a treadmill. It's like it just – it keeps – the belt keeps turning and keeps turning. And it's like oh. the carrot, like the dangling yeah. carrot, you know? Yeah and going. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. And I'm sure that my people listening can can agree that, that that's something that they can relate with. It's that feeling of not being pretty enough, not being smart enough, not being productive enough. Um, all of those things that can be never ending. So I guess like you could narrow that answer down to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone. Well, we all we all have it though. So yeah. it's it's really interesting when you start talking to a, you know a lot of clients because you just you realize how connected we all are. Mhm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would love to know how did you get here? What was your path to enoughness? Like do you have did you did something happen or have you always been passionate about this? Well, It's been a long journey, but I would say that I've had kind of some epiphanies most recently within the past year, year and a half. I've always been driven, always been very ambitious. I've been a go-getter. I've been a go, go, go kind of girl. I love goals. I love achieving stuff. And earlier this year, my husband was deployed for six months. And while he was gone, I had no boundaries whatsoever with work. And I pushed myself and pushed myself. And it was like, 
maybe two weeks before he's going to get home. I'm walking my dogs and I'm thinking back to the past six months of like, what have I done? Like, what has my life been about? And I realized just how out of balance I was and that I was striving, 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 striving. I'm like, why do I keep pushing myself like this? And it was because I thought that if I could just get here or attain that or be making this, then it would be enough. Mm-hmm. But the really big thing was, is that I had been moving the bar on myself my whole life. So I realized something had to change or I would always be chasing, chasing, chasing and never fully enjoying. Mm-hmm. So what did, what did you do in those moments when, when you realized that? I did something that was really scary. I took a really huge step back and I actually reached out to you right before I did it. I was, I didn't know if this was the same period of time. (laughs) Yes. I was like, I feel like I need to stop and I need to take some time for myself. And you know, you really gave me the permission that I needed. So Mm -hmm. thank you for that. Cause you're like, then do it if that's what you feel. That's right. And I'm like, that's the push I needed. Thank Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And so I took four months away and really learned how to define myself, not by what I do, but who I am. And that was a really scary thing because I had never done that before. I was so wrapped up in my labels and what who I thought I was to the world. And really finding out who I was without all that was a very self-discovery experience, to say the least. Well, that's such and – and that was probably such a courageous move for you. And it's it's funny because this, this to me, points to the, the topic of productivity. Mm. And I think for so many – people, um, you know, I'm, of course I'm speaking more specifically to women cause that's my primary audience mm-hmm. is that we put so much value around how productive we are and, yeah. you know, the things on our to-do list and checking off the boxes and we, it's, we put busyness on such a pedestal, like we worship it. Oh, tell me about <laughs> it. Well, it's like, we're only as good as what we're able to get done. Right. That's mm. how, that's our measure. And it's so interesting. I have a private client who is very similar to you, you know, and just like extremely productive. And I was joking with her one time and she was telling me like all this, she gave me this like laundry list of things that she was doing for this one particular project. And I teased her and I said, did you get all that done 10 minutes before we talked on the phone today? Because <laughs> like, that's how good she is at it. But I know that she is putting a lot of her worth and her value on this. And so mm. it being, it was November when we were speaking and so I gave her the assignment of not taking on any more projects via work or via her personal life for the rest of the year and it's only you know it was you know just less just shy of two months that they gave her this challenge and she was like oh my god (laughs) and I was like good like that's the reaction that I wanted to evoke in you and it's and it's not that I want her to even rest and recharge like that's that's a bonus that's great but like I wanted her to be in that uncomfortableness and like that yeah. gray area because for us for it's like I know what's going on in a lot of people's minds and I, I assume this was the case for you too Megan where it was like if I don't t- take any projects on for four months or two months then I am a slacker then I'm wasting time then I you know it's like we we make it mean something Oh, the guilt trip totally sets in. I mean, and I had a lot of resistance to this. I mean, a lot. And it, I, I thank God for the coach that I was working with at the time that was like, you you can do this and you have to do it. Be- do you see how much resistance and fear? Like fear is guiding your life right now. Mm-hmm. And that was the thing that I didn't even realize that I was working from such a fear-based space of don't miss out, don't get left behind, hurry up and get there, achieve, 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 or else you're going to be a failure. Right. There was all of these fears that were really just, oh my God, they were strangling me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even realize it. it was the scariest part. Yeah. You know what I have found is really helpful in that. And for anyone listening, I, you know, I have like the mantra of like, keep your eyes on your own paper because I get in trouble with that too. I think the internet just destroys us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're listening and you have an online business. And even if you don't, if you go on any social media site and you're looking at your, your neighbors and your friends from high school or the girls from college, and you're looking at their lives and you're making up all these things, and then you make that mean something about your own life. So I have found that truly like unplugging from the internet and from social media uh, can be very, very helpful in those times where like you were describing, it's like do more faster, 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 get it done, do it before she does it. You're going to miss out like all of that mirage of the inner critic stuff. Boo. Oh, yeah. Never feels good. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. Well, thanks you for thank you for sharing that super vulnerable story. And yeah, it's just isn't it interesting though, like that whole permission granted. And I think sometimes 
what's really interesting, you know, like enough, just throwing that out there for people listening is that sometimes I think just reaching out to our friends and just saying like, this is what I want to do. And I think I just kind of like need to give myself permission. And then hopefully your, your people, I call them like your compassionate witnesses will be like, girl, just do it. You know, like mm-hmm. we, we make up like that the world is going to stop turning. <laughs> Oh my, no, that is so true. Like the world is going to fall apart if we stop putting effort towards things. And Mm -hmm. if we're not, you know, actively engaged and thriving and doing, 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 hurrying, 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 like the world's just going to fall apart. Sometimes I get mad that it doesn't fall apart. (laughs) (laughs) I know because then you really like fall into the fallacy. It's like, there's no hiding anymore. Like you're really not that important. (laughs) People are capable without me. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yes. It's humbling though. And I think it's needed. It's important to have those humbling moments of, you know, we, we put so much pressure on ourselves and we get very serious about our lives and who we are a lot of the time and to have an experience like, wow, we put forth so much effort into worry and fear when it really does not matter that much. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. A thousand percent. So, okay, let's go back to the topic of <clears throat> worthiness and feeling enough and and really starting that whole journey. And I think that people can can listen to these podcasts and and think about the whole concept of worthiness and they get a little bit overwhelmed because they're so deep in their criteria and you know trying to trying to get to this um this marker or milepost that they've created. And so where do people even begin with this? What is what would be like their first step? It's really just getting honest with yourself, really. Um, you know, I think that we all have this idea of what happiness is or what fulfillment is or what success is and getting really clear on like, well, when is that going to happen? And how is that, how is this definition impacting your happiness right now? (laughs) We are so Mm -hmm. notorious for postponing happiness and fulfillment until we get to this next space or have this or have that. And we don't realize that we're completely capable of having it right now, just as things are. So I would say it really starts with just getting honest with how are you postponing joy? Mm, How are you postponing joy? Yeah, I I agree. Well, you know what's interesting too, you know, speaking of joy, and this is kind of off topic, but it, it made me think of it. And I think it's important to talk about too, is that, you know, because a lot of the work that you and I do is surrounded in vulnerability because Mm -hmm. all of it. All of it. I mean, just, and I don't even need to define it. All of it with a capital I is about vulnerability. And mm-hmm. it's been a common theme of my clients lately about leaning into the uncomfortable. And part of that is leaning into the joy. Yeah. Because I find with a lot of the people that I work with, and I'm sure you, it's the same with your people too, is that to feel all of the feels is really uncomfortable. And you know, the shame and the guilt and the frustration and the anger and the disappointment and all of those like, quote unquote, harder emotions, those we don't want to lean into. But then when you start talking about joy and bliss, I find that my people have a really hard time leaning into that too. Oh, I and I agree. And I think a part of that is because we pick up this message somewhere along the way that we have to work for it mm-hmm. in order to deserve it. And so if we don't feel like we've worked hard enough, then experiencing joy is something that it's really hard for us to allow sometimes. That's a good point. Yeah, I hadn't actually thought about it that way. I I think I I was looking at it from like a more general standpoint of just that the whole like waiting for the other shoe to drop and rehearsing tragedy and things like that. But I love what you're saying. And and forgive me if I'm mistaken, but what I feel like that points to is some shame and guilt around some people feeling privilege. Mm. Mm. Oh, I really like that. I mean, I, I've struggled with that. Like the whole, um, like my problems aren't bad enough. Like I, and I know that I've, I've heard other people talk about this too. It's like, they feel like their struggles and their feelings around their struggles are not worthy because they have it so good. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that Oh, there's a whole nother I just layer opened up a can of worms with that. I know. <laughs> I, I think it's something that we need to talk about because I, I think sometimes when we feel sad, mm-hmm. um, we feel shameful for feeling sad because we're supposed to be happy. Mm-hmm. And our, our culture does a really good job of saying you're supposed to be happy. You're supposed to be this. And so when we're not that, not only do we not feel that, but we beat ourselves up because we're not that. So there's this extra level of like self-shaming that's, that goes on. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's, you know, I'm all for inspiration and motivating memes on Instagram and things like that. But I think that um, I'm always a big fan of feeling whatever it is that you feel. I remember when I was, I tell this story commonly and like when I was going through <clears throat> my divorce and I was feeling really humiliated over the events that, that had taken place. And when I would tell people that, people were shocked and like, why should you feel humiliated? He's the one that did the bad deeds, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm, and I was made to feel wrong and it wasn't their fault. You know, they were, they were stating their opinion, but I remember like, it was the first time I was consciously aware that I was made to feel wrong for what I felt and then it made me feel angry. And then I was less connected to people. And so I think that, you know, whatever you feel, you feel, I mean, speaking of giving permission to to do things. I I just, I think that many of us need to take a good look at giving ourselves permission to feel whatever it is that we need to feel. And, you know, that's the, that's probably one of the biggest pieces of the enoughness work that I do is really getting into the messiness of our emotional life and allowing all of it to be okay. Because we are notorious for abandoning the pieces of ourselves that are, are we, we deem not okay, that mm-hmm. they're, they're not enough or they shouldn't be feeling this way or they're not supposed to be like this or whatever it is that we're creating in our minds. And so we just try and put this piece of ourselves aside and we're like, just, you know, you fix that, fix it yourself. I don't have to deal with it. Right. And so there's this pattern of self-abandonment that goes on. And if we don't give ourselves permission to embrace it all. Yeah. And I feel like too, it, I mean, something could have happened in like 1990, And we abandoned it back then. And like I I have been saying lately, like we can't bury our feelings alive and expect them to die. And like, Lord knows I have tried. Like Mm, (laughs) I've buried those suckers a (laughs) hundred feet deep and they don't die. And I think that a lot of times too, what happens when you start to do this work, it, it happened for me. Like when I went to San Antonio for my training in 2014, um, and did this work, what came out two decades later was, um, and I just released this on my, my podcast. Um, if you guys missed it, it was episode 72, I believe. Um, I was date raped when I was 19 and for 20 years, I completely blamed myself. I made up that it just wasn't that big of a deal. It was, it was my fault. I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have been drinking, blah, blah, blah. Same story that you, a lot of people can probably relate to. Mm -hmm. And once it came out, it was like, I described it as like projectile vomit of feelings. I was just like, oh, this, I have, I have done a very good job of locking this up and burying it and expecting it to die. And it didn't. And once I gave myself permission and felt that I was in a safe enough place to actually um, accept that it was a traumatic thing that happened, that um, then I was able to do the work of self-forgiveness, of forgiving him, of moving forward with it. But it, uh, trust me, almost 21 years I had locked that up. Well, you know, the thing is, and and this is probably the biggest mistake I've made in my life, is falling into the fallacy that time's going to heal all wounds. And Mm -hmm. that's that's not what happens. Like, you know, your 19-year-old self, she needs your wisdom and your compassion to go back and give her the love that she needed back Mm -hmm. then. And she can't do that without you. So she, she doesn't know how to do it without you. And it's only by your life experiences that you've gained since you were 19 that you now have that awareness to go back and really help her and be with her and say, it's okay for you to feel this way. And I'm here with you now. You're not doing it alone. And together we can heal this. Yeah. And that's like the beautiful healing journey that allows us to be enough because we're embracing all of these pieces of ourselves that we have tried to lock away. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and that's what gives us our authenticity when we can bring our whole selves to the table. We're embracing it all. There's not pieces of ourselves that we're trying to deny. Right. I think you just brought up a really good point too about authenticity. I think that I think that like being the whole like quote unquote being yourself is only part of the equation. Mm-hmm. I think that you just nailed it. It's the whole concept of embracing all the parts of ourselves. And it, it really and, and Brene teaches us this about abandoning parts of our stories and or she says like orphaning parts of your stories is mm-hmm is really um, a fearful act. It's acting out of fear. And like to be truly courageous is to embrace all of the parts of our stories. And and the example I just gave you is one of those. And then also for me, I had to also sort of like, for lack of a better word, like apologize to my former self. Absolutely. For, um, because what happened is when I started to come into, you know, 
when I was really deep into my personal development journey or probably around like three years in, I started to feel really ashamed of how I had behaved and, you know, still kind of blaming myself. And it's like, well, I can kind of forgive myself, but I still should not have been acting that way. And oh my God, I can't believe how codependent I was and, Mm -hmm. you know, all of these things. And so it took a lot of reflection and just a a lot of more so like self-compassion of like, I was not well back then. And I'm sorry that I have been thinking of you this way and treating, because I, I looked at it as like, I would never, like if you, Megan, were telling me about your 19-year-old self and being drunk at a party and, you know, flirting with a boy and ended up, I wouldn't have been like, that was really stupid. Like you should not, like, I would be horrified if someone was speaking to you that way, like, let alone I would never. So like, why was it okay for me to speak to, about my 19 year old self that way? I know. So I, there was a, there was a huge element of that as well. Well, you know, you're really talking about forgiveness. There has to be this forgiving element of what happened back then. And, you know, a, a lot of my story in my teens and early twenties, especially, you know, just struggling with substance abuse and all of the reckless things I did during that time. That was probably the beginning of my own healing journey is actually going back and healing those times. And what I had to realize is that, you know, that substance abuse is as reckless and dangerous as it was and harming and shaming. It probably saved my life because the emotions that I was experiencing back then, I didn't know how to cope any other way. And if I didn't have the coping mechanism of drugs and alcohol, as twisted as it might be, I might not be here. Right. So I had to actually go and thank my rebellious self of saying, you know, I don't, I don't like what you did, but I'm glad that you did it because you saved us. And now we can heal from that. And I forgive you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a big believer that we, we do have to get lost before we actually find ourselves. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if anyone's listening and you, (laughs) and you feel like you're lost, guess, guess what? You're in the exact place that you need to be in. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a question for you. So do you believe that the whole concept of feeling enough is simply a decision that we make. It's like a yes or no, or is it more than that? I would say that it, it's a yes and no answer, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So in order for us to make another choice, in order for something new to be true, we have to create a space for that new truth to be okay. And we're not going to be able to do that unless we unravel the stories that are preventing it from being true in the first place. So what I mean by that is if we have a really strong belief that we have to be perfect in order to be enough, and you have years of substance abuse where you did a lot of imperfect things, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, it's going to be really hard for you to say, but I'm still enough in spite of that because you still have that perfectionistic belief. So you really have to go and unravel that story that you're telling yourself in order to make room for this new truth to be okay. Very, very true. Yes. Because it's interesting because I remember when when I was listening to, and this is probably back in 2010 when Brene's first TED Talk came out. And uh, I, I, I've watched it so many times. I think it's like Me around too. minute eight where she says, <laughs> where she talks about her research and how the difference between the people that knew that they were worthy and love and belonging and the people that still struggled with it. She said the difference was that the people that believed they were worthy of love and belonging simply decided that it was so. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, really? Mm. (laughs) And you know, that's why I love so much what she talks about in rising strong, because she really talks about the stories we tell ourselves Mm -hmm. and how, how we heal those stories where we can choose that we're enough. Mm -hmm. But I I don't think that it's just as easy as flipping on a light switch. I really do think you have to get into your story and make room for a new story to to be your truth. And it doesn't happen overnight, not by any means. And it's not just something you can decide because our beliefs are something we've carried, you know, since we were very, very little. A lot of, you know, a lot of the beliefs I talk about with my clients, we go back to like when you're five or six and making sense of the world and who you think you need to be in order to get your needs met. Mm -hmm. And we do, we carry these beliefs and these experiences for so long and we have no idea that they even still impact us today. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's so interesting. My daughter is six and she's (laughs) in kindergarten. And um, I, my case consultant, when I was going through my Daring Way certification, 
is a, a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she loves research. And she was telling me about this new research, and I wish I could cite it better. I'm terrible at this. But she was talking about anxiety disorder and how their scientists are creating parallels between perfectionism and anxiety disorder, and they're actually uncovering. And there's theories that perfectionism is actually in our alleles. It's like it's actually in our DNA, and wow. they're trying to name it. And, and I'm like, oh my God, because I was diagnosed I have that. in I have three. That. <laughs> and so my daughter, who is my spawn, uh-huh. <laughs> who is my mini me, she got, we got her report card yesterday and under, you know, like shows her strengths. And of course it's, she's just spunky and loves hugging people and smiles all the time. And then under her, you know, ways to improve, um, they were saying that she, it's a confidence issue. And then when she gets things wrong, that the tears come and mm-hmm. she is afraid to try new things because she doesn't want to get it wrong. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, and then of course I immediately go to like, what did, what did I do? Like, what did, where did I go wrong in raising her in these short six years where I have put this on her? Cause I don't think, cause I try not absolutely like we don't have like really high standards. Like uh, it's, it's a delicate balance. I parenting, I still have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm, I, it's very interesting to me, the whole concept of, of, and I think that like, I don't know if it's in the water or what, but I think that we are, our generation, like we somehow, I just think it's our world, like that we're raising anxious people. Like I'm an anxious person. <laughs> oh no, no. And I, I'll totally write off on that because I, you know, we live in a perfectionistic culture. Yeah, we do. And it's a very performance driven. It's very appearance driven mm-hmm. and it's a very non-emotional culture. I mean, it really is, you know, you need to have it all together. I need to keep it all together and you need to do everything right. And you need to be the best. And I mean, it's, it's very driven in that way. And so I think that a lot of us are not even aware of how much we absorb Mm -hmm. just from the culture around us. Like not to mention like our upbringing and like, you know, the way our parents have impacted us, us, just the culture itself. Like we're fed these messages from such an early age and it comes in all types of forms, you know, like even cartoons and magazines, like, you know, all those magazines, when you're five, you're like, you know, three feet tall, all these magazines of women, they're right there within eyesight. Mm -hmm. And we're just not even aware how that's impacting them or even how it impacted us. Yeah. I mean, we don't even, they haven't even ever had cable. We've never had cable. (laughs) And I thought Mm -hmm. maybe that was like the cure all, but apparently it's not. And it's just, I'm definitely raising my children to grow up in a house where your emotions are okay. And yeah. like we have conversations, like we have emotional conversations. They've seen me cry before and we talk about it. And um, it's really interesting to me. I may have told this story on my podcast before, but this was, I don't know, maybe a year ago. I had had a really hard conversation with my mom and like hung up the phone and Jason walked in the door like right at that moment. And I think like I was like, you know, like on the verge of tears. And then when I saw him, I started crying And he was like, what happened? (laughs) I was sitting on the bottom step of our house and telling him like what had happened with this conversation with my mom and, um, and he's standing there and then, and then I kind of realized that my kids were there and they, it was almost like instinctually they came up like bookends and sat next to me on the stairs and just were there near me. Mm. And I kind of didn't notice it. I mean, I didn't realize what was going on. There was a part of me who was like, maybe I shouldn't have this breakdown in front of them. And then, but we talked about it later. And, and, you know, my son was like, I was a little bit scared when you were crying. And so we were, we talked about it. And, um, but then I was talking to a friend of mine who's a therapist and she was like, that's actually really good because you're modeling a few things. You're modeling like what it looks like for their per- their parents to have a conversation facing each other where one parent is being emotional and the other one is listening. Mm-hmm. And then you're also modeling that you can cry and be vulnerable in front of them and that it's okay. Like you're not making it wrong at all and that you yeah. can recover and, you mm-hmm. know, and like, and feel better. Yeah. So it's like, cause I don't want, I don't want them to think that any emotion is wrong. They're not wrong for crying just as, you know, they aren't wrong for being happy. Right. Yeah. I right. didn't grow up like that. So, <laughs> like, so really my parents didn't do that. Uh, well, I think a lot of us, we don't grow up with that for right. sure. And, uh, I think, and that's what Brene talks about in Rising Strong too, about this whole um, emotional illiteracy and how, and she says she grew up like that too, where nobody was vulnerable, like, and that was considered weakness and you just soldier on and buck up. 
Oh, for sure. I mean, I think the thing that's most interesting about the story is that, you know, your daughter is becoming upset because she feels vulnerable. And that's something that she needs to improve upon in the teacher's eyes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, we got some work to do on that one. And, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> it's, it's just way, it Megan. It's a normal reaction, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So you have a blog, which I spent some time on, and I love your post. And, and any of the links and resources, you guys, that you hear in this podcast are at yourkickasslife.com forward slash seven seven. So you wrote a post called Five Steps to Having Enough and Staying Enough. And in the second step, you talk about getting into your story. So can mm -hmm. you tell the listeners what you mean by that? So I think we have two different layers of stories. We have the story that we're telling ourselves right now about whatever is going on in our lives, because that's what our mind does. It makes sense of what's going on. And then we have this story that's feeding the current story. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we have we have the early story that we've been carrying for a long time of, of what our belief system is, of how the world works and how we work in it. So getting into your story is first being aware of what the story you're telling yourself right now is. And that's just how you're interpreting situations. Then also, if it's a shaming story, especially what stories underneath that of who you think that you need to be or how you're supposed to be different than you are right now. Mm, yes. <laughs> yeah. And we all, how we do all you need to be them. different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. That sounds a lot like an exercise that I do about <clears throat> perceptions and like how we want the world to perceive us. And cause what are those things? It's like, it's floating around in your subconscious, like take, just pick an area of your life and, ask yourself, like, how do I want the world to perceive me? And there's, there's a list. I know there's a list. And then there's also the opposite of the perceptions that you would never want anyone. It's kind of the same thing. But yeah, yours is a story. Let me let me give you an example. So something I'm going through right now, something we actually talked about before we started this is I, you know, I'm feeling I work online. So it's very isolating. And I just moved to a new town. So I'm not very plugged into the society or the, you know, people here. And I'm like, I really am starting to feel lonely. And I'm missing friends. And the story I'm telling myself right now is if I go out and I try and reach out to people, they're going to think I'm needy, going to be a needy person that needs friends and support. And the story that's feeding that is I shouldn't need anybody. Mm -hmm. I should be enough on my own. And so there's two different layers of stories here. One is I think I'm going to be needy because I'm reaching out because I need friends, which is... <laughs> Totally crazy. Like, it's okay to need friends. We all need friends. But oh the more gosh. damaging story is that I should have it figured out all on my own. Right. And that's probably the most damaging one because that's the one that's going to actually prevent me from reaching out. And so it's really being aware of that story of saying, that's not true. That's not true. One, you're not needy because you need friends. Everyone needs friends. And two, no one has it all figured out on their own. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's so interesting. I'm, I'm, um, I had a group program earlier this year and I talk a lot about the behavior of isolation and what I mean more specifically is like, um, when you do need help, which we all do is a lot of women don't reach out, you know, and they, mm -hmm. they make up that, um, they should be able to do it all on their own. They, um, nobody else has the problems that they do. So and a lot of times they're like embarrassed over it. They don't want to be a burden. They don't, like you were saying, like they don't want to be perceived as needy or desperate mm -hmm. or not strong or weak or, or whatever. And um, one of the women in my group classes in the private Facebook group that I was running with it said, can you explain more about isolation? And so I have a, I have a blog post that, that really gets into detail in it. And she was like, this is so interesting because my entire life I have made up that I am strongest when I am doing everything on my own. I am strongest when I'm isolating. Mm. And I was just like, my heart broke open. And I'm like, no, there is like scientific evidence to tell you that that, and that's a myth of vulnerability that comes from Brene's research is yeah. that, that vulnerability is weakness, that reaching out and saying, I need help Mm -hmm. is weakness. And a lot of times it's not like we want someone to come over and like fix all of our problems and clean our house from top to bottom. We just want someone to listen without judgment and just have that compassionate witness. That's it. It's about connection. I mean, it really is like, that's what I'm needing so much right now. It's like, I just want to go and have a really awesome conversation with another woman. Human. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. because it makes you feel like you're not, you're not alone and there's somebody out there, you know? 
Yes. Because that's why we're here, you guys. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, to reproduce and <laughs> <laughs> to connect with other humans. Yes. What surprises you about the work you do with women? Mm. I think that one of the most beautiful things is that when we really get into the enoughness work is that every single woman realizes that there is a little girl that lives inside of her that she hasn't talked to in a really long time. And to watch that relationship deepen and watching love and compassion and forgiveness and healing transform that, it transforms the way they live. And I think it's really interesting stuff that we don't even realize that that little girl's in there. And just within the first two days of doing some of this work, it's like the emotional floodgates are just like, holy wow. I'm Mm -hmm. like, yeah, girl, (laughs) (laughs) it's going to be some good stuff in there. And there's going to be a whole lot more interconnection. And that's where you're going to find your truth. And it's, it's really cool stuff. Yeah, it is. It is. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. (laughs) Oh, Oh gosh. Well, I think that about wraps it up. And I, I thank you so incredibly much for being here and sharing your wisdom and, and sharing your own vulnerability and talking about your own struggles. And I know that that helps my audience so much to hear that even the people that we have, that I, the experts that I bring on, on my podcast with all of their degrees and certifications and experience and, and wisdom, like still fight the good fight every single day. So I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's the human piece of us all. And I, I really appreciate that you're giving a voice to that. So thank you. You're welcome. And where where's the best way for people to be able to find you and find out more about what you do? You can visit me on my website, which is megan-hale.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for, I was getting a drink of water and <laughs> that, was <the> <laughs> <I thought. laughs> that was really fast, huh? <laughs> it was. Megan-Hale.com. You guys go over and say hi. And until next time, I will see you all out in cyberspace. Bye-bye. Thank you.